you know, from an advertising uh, communications agency, what are the different things that we are seeing at the moment? Um, so I think it's a very challenging time for the industry. I think for brands, for marketeers, for advertising uh, people, communications people in this sector, um, I think it's probably one of the most challenging times. But also, I think it's also very exciting because we are forced to rethink the norm. You know, I think it's all about changing our, our game, changing the way we look at uh, communicating with our audiences. And I think um, it's, a, it's a great learning experience. I'm not saying we're all going to get it right. I think we are going to have a big learning curve in the next year and two, year or two. So looking at the last few months, something that we're seeing a lot is, you know, the, how it's changing consumer behavior. If you take people, I mean, look at yourself. Uh, people are really putting family first now. I think everyone's about how to protect their families, uh, you know, be cautious about how they spend. Uh, behavior is a, a, is a lot more measured. Uh, we've lost some of the spontaneity of life. And I think uh, naturally because these are very, you know, scary times. Um, I think we also see uh, that news consumption has really gone up uh, because everybody is anxious to know what is happening. And I think for a while there, we kind of took our eye off the ball, but in the last uh, 10 days, I think people have gone back to what it was like in April, even more fearful because the spread of COVID has obviously changed, is going to force us to change behavior again. So I think news consumption is definitely skyrocketing. And I think, um, you know, when you're in lockdown and when you're not moving around very much, uh, people need to be entertained at home. I think this is very important. And uh, how do brands capitalize on this? How do media uh, channels capitalize on the fact that people are seeking more entertainment? Um, people also are a lot more pragmatic and practical. I think what we're seeing now is that uh, people know that they can't wait and see how things are going to go I think they see the need to organize themselves right now as it is. I think all of us are doing that and we are a typical consumer. Um, and I think um, consumption enriching content, you know, uh, is definitely on the up and up. If you see the number of webinars, you're seeing the number of courses that are being offered online. There's a lot, uh, a lot of uh, rich content that people are seeking. There's a lot of rich content out there and tapping into those are definitely what consumers are doing now. And also working from home. Uh, we are, a lot of people are working from home. So it is changing the work culture. We're looking at uh, flexible work hours, uh, longer work hours. We're working through the night, we're working on weekends. So these are some of the changes that we are seeing uh, in consumer behavior. So if you look at things like media spends, uh, we see some trends now in the banking field, there's definitely a drop because central bank has uh, requested banks to reduce their media spends, their advertising spends. So there is a definite drop uh, on advertising spends uh, in the category of finance. You will see, uh, if you do the measurements now, you will, you will see that there is a definite drop. Uh, on the other hand, you see the telecom sector very active because there's a huge amount of a data consumption that is being utilized. I think if there's any winner in this situation, it is the telecom sector. They are the winners at the moment uh, because everyone's living online and everyone's a lot more into data. Uh, everyone's watching Netflix, uh, not everyone, but a lot of people are on uh, you know, uh, DTH and all of this, which is all about band, uh, bandwidth consumption. And you're also seeing that there's a lot less white goods for sale. The reason is because government has, uh, and vehicles, because government has stopped the import of these things, uh, of these consumer goods. So uh, there is a definite drop in spend on advertising for the categories of white goods and uh, motor vehicles. However, FMCGs, strangely, like biscuit companies, have done really well. And uh, it's interesting because uh, this kind of category has seen growth. And I think that, uh, that it's, it's an interesting dynamic to see that people are consuming a lot of FMCGs. 
And I think that um, even things like um, e-commerce, we are seeing a, a big growth in e-commerce and uh, we, we see brands like uh, consumer brands, like FMCG brands are also now looking at e-commerce. Some of them have set up small e-commerce sites. They're selling, it could be spice companies. It could be, uh, you're seeing a lot more of e-commerce uh, uh, development, uh, even in a small way, but it is happening. Um, then we are also seeing uh, CSR, you know, there are certain things like education, uh, brands like Guru.LK, I mean, they have given free access to coursework. Uh, so dialogue is not, at one point they were not charging for this. Um, so you're seeing that kind of behavior as well. And we are also looking and there's a lot of new content that is coming on. So I think these are some of the things that we are seeing in the industry that we see as changes. Um, TV usage has grown significantly uh, and we see that more people are watching TV, but now they may be watching it uh, on different devices, not necessarily on their conventional TV sets, but they could be watching it on their handphones, on their mobiles, on their iPads, on their computers. So there is a multiple device usage and uh, there's a definite growth in TV viewership. Uh, it's more, I would say, um, I think that this has been one growth area. We are also seeing that uh, there's an increased male viewership on TV because I think quite a lot of people are at home. So they automatically watch more TV uh, or they're watching it on their devices. So you are seeing an increase in this. Uh, you're also say, seeing you know, higher consumption of uh, DTH penetration. So um, I think uh, Dialog TV and Dish TV, I think there's definitely an increase. More people are going in for it. You're seeing a lot more people are watching Netflix. Um, I've seen people going in for Amazon Prime. Pure TV is offering an additional um, value package where if you pay another 1,700 rupees more on your premium package, they give you unlimited access to watch Amazon Prime, uh, uh, um, Netflix, and uh, you know, other channels as well. So, so they're also encouraging this. So I think this is important because uh, this limits advertising on these channels because people don't have advertising on these channels. Um, so people are shifting into uh, more of this kind of entertainment. Um, what else do we have? Um, I think you're seeing a lot more usage of TV on non-prime time as well. And I think the reason for this is because uh, people want to be entertained. So the TV is on a lot more during the day and people are watching and uh, there's a huge increase in YouTube viewership as well. And actually YouTube today is as, as, has as many views, viewers as perhaps a third channel. If you look at it, they almost come as a number three channel if you take their, uh, the viewership of YouTube. Um, I'm also looking at one of the challenges I think that uh, the local channels have is their inability to create uh, in, in, in sufficient amount of content. Because during the COVID, uh, you know, times, uh, production became a real challenge because uh, people couldn't go out and actually produce some of the teledrama. So there's been a problem of getting more content and continuing some of their series. So I think they would have just started to pick up, but they will have challenges again. So you're seeing some reruns of uh, popular dramas. Uh, so I think uh, for them, you know, creating teledramas and continuing their current programs are going to be a bit of a challenge. How they are going to do it, I think is something we have to wait and see. Um, I think also the media that perhaps has got most affected is the print media. I think you see a decline in newspaper, newspaper readership. And I think that is because people are cons you know, constantly consuming news, uh, on as you go, because you don't have to wait for the newspaper to be published because you've got updates and uh, so much of uh, community spread of media within you know, WhatsApp groups and families and sharing of information that by the time you see the newspaper the next day, you know most of what has happened in the data. So I think print is a medium that is going to be quite challenged. Uh, and I think that, you know, for them, they're going to have to really invest more in their news sites uh, and try to divert 
some of their advertising traffic into uh, to their online news portals. So I think this is something that is going to be a challenge for them. Um, I think what is really important is the rise in data consumption. I think we are going to see uh, this is a huge growth area, and I think, uh, and this is something I'd like to spend a little bit more time on because I think today data is becoming really, really critical because consumers, um, you know what? Uh, okay, so when we talk of data, um, streaming services are a bit of a challenge because we are not getting uh, the kind of bandwidth in some cases. Uh, and so I think that is something that uh, the government hopefully uh, and the operators will invest more. And I think with the launch of 5G, it's going to dramatically change how people will consume uh, news, I mean, consume programs, uh, because it's going to make it so much easier. I mean, you can download a full movie in, in 25 <laughs> seconds. That's what 5G is going to I said, we are also seeing a shift uh, you know, it's not happening as fast as I think it should, where budgets, media budgets should be moving more towards digital and also data driven media like programmatic, where you can really look at uh, buying audiences rather than buying placements. So I think this is something that uh, uh, marketers have not really fully embraced or fully understand the value of uh, programmatic uh, advertising, but globally today, 60% um, of ad budgets have moved to programmatic because marketeers are looking now to talk directly to your audiences. So this is something that I think we have to adopt. Sri Lanka as a country has been very slow to adopt digital. Uh, it's always like um, uh, a kind of tokenism that is given to digital, which I think is is really um, surprising when we are a country that is so far ahead in the mobile world. Uh, we have, you know, what, 130% of uh, um, SIM connectivity. And also we are now going into 5G. So we are way ahead of many countries. Yet, when it comes to uh, uh, marketeers and, and, and brand advertising, Digital is always at the bottom of the line. You know, it's very, very minuscule and people are not willing to invest. I mean, I, I battle this all the time that they don't, a, a, a client, a brand doesn't think twice about spending 350,000 rupees uh, to, to run one commercial, 30 second commercial uh, on, a, on a channel during prime time, but would fight you to give you 150,000 rupees a month to manage their social media. It just makes no sense to me. And I'm, I'm always saying, why, why do you look at it like that? Because your social media page uh, and your engagement is, your, is the face of your company online. It is such an important uh, you know, face of your brand, but yet most brands will try and push you down to a ridiculous amount to manage your social media, which is your reputation, which is the company's face to the consumer. <laughs> So, so these are some of the, I think, things that, you know, um, haven't been adopted fast enough. And in this current stage where everyone's moving online, where uh, you're, you know, all of us, and we are all digital natives, all of us. And why, why brands are not investing uh, at this particular time where we are being forced to fast track to get online uh, is taking uh, is taking time. Brands are not yet adopting fast enough. There are some brands that are investing and those brands will be the winners uh, and the ones who are slow adopters will be the losers in the long time. So that's my personal view on this. Um, I think um, on things like, um, let's see, I'm just looking at some points that here I've made. Um, I think you're seeing also increased uh, number of e-commerce uh, sites, I think during COVID and you're beginning to see it again, uh, uh, the delivery services of all your supermarkets, people are ordering online. And I think it also gave a lot of opportunities for smaller, uh, small time players to get their brands out there uh, because they had the ability to respond very quickly to consumers, you know, and uh, bigger, bigger companies, bigger brands, 
sometimes to get their infrastructure and get their whole movement together takes time. So I think this, this particular you know, time in the last few months, we have seen the opportunity for a lot of small players uh, to be able to come in and actually make a name for themselves, build some reputation and build some core customers who have remained loyal to them because they have been uh, very uh, customer friendly, uh, very um, engaged, um, very responsive. Um, and I think this is an important aspect that uh, we have seen uh, develop. Okay, so I would say a couple of things. Um, I think the opportunities are there uh, on the back of what has happened um, and what is happening right now uh, for brands to actually jump in and take advantage of the situation. Um, I would, I would you know, go back to this whole concept of the importance of uh, data, you know, because today brands without realizing it are sitting on so much information about your customers and your consumers. It's amazing amount of information that you're sitting on, but a lot of brands don't know how to use it. They don't know what to do with this data. It's just sitting there, not being used. And I think that is, a, is something that you know, companies and marketeers uh, should be really studying how to aggregate this data, how to build a really effective uh, uh, CRM, you know, which they can tap into, which is constantly uh, collecting data. I mean, if you look at Google, for example, it's very interesting. Um, Google knows so much about you. Facebook knows so, so much about you. you know, um, Today, with the kind of data uh, you know, capture that is happening, brands can predict what, how you behave. I mean, today data is all about understanding the consumer in a very personal way. I mean, if you take your bank, for example, they would know what you spend on, what your interests are. You know, are you a health freak or are you a, um, somebody who likes to go out? Do you, um, are you, um, you know, somebody who believes in, are you um, fashion, fashion conscious? Are you somebody who, um, you know, wants to be educated more? Uh, because they can track the type of spending you do. You go to a supermarket. I mean, this I use something that always amazes me. I shop in a particular supermarket very close to me. And I've been shopping there for years they must be knowing every product I buy. So they would know if they really aggregated my data, they would know that I'm into organic food. Um, I, you know, I, am, uh, I buy you know, certain type of products. Um, and on a Saturday morning, I get a text blast from them saying 20% uh, off on dal, 5% off on rice, uh, something else, something else. Just absolutely you know, a text blast. I don't even look at it. It means nothing to me. But on the other hand, if they were to get back to me and say, hey, Neela, we know you like organic and uh, we've just got some really great fresh organic vegetables in. Why don't you pop into our store today and, you know, buy some. Now, that's the difference when you have the data and you're looking at your data and you're talking to me, Neela, who is somebody who likes to shop in your in, in kills or whatever, and I'm into organic food. So this is where, you know, the customer engagement and this is where data becomes so important. And uh, programmatic, for example, is a really important part of uh, the future of how brands should engage customers. So, because no longer, you know, uh, data is no longer about targeting segments. It's no longer about buying ad spaces. It's all about buying audiences. So when you invest in this kind of um, platforms, your return on, uh, return on investment is very powerful because A, you know there is no wastage because you're talking to the people who you want to talk to. Uh, it's also you're reaching the customers that you want. And also customers want something personal from you. They want you to tell them a little bit, you know, make you feel special and that's what digital is able to do. This is what, you know, a mainstream media can't do. 
that's why this medium is going to become so powerful in the future. So I think um, uh, there are some other things, I mean, I can talk about even in, in terms of data. Now, you know that Facebook, uh, although you don't sell, you can't buy any ad space on WhatsApp. The amount of data that Facebook is collecting through your WhatsApp, they know everything about you. It's amazing. You know, that's why suddenly um, when you're on your Facebook page, you get served a certain kind of ad and you're like, wow, how is that possible? Because they've tracked you through WhatsApp also. So although you can't uh, buy ads on WhatsApp, your data is used to target you using the data on WhatsApp. So, you know, even True Caller, they say uh, um, that they can now, through their insights, they can predict a call even before it actually rings. That's the level of information they have about their customers. So, so there will come a time where data will be so detailed that it might even become too much for, for a human to process. So I, I, I guess uh, artificial intelligence will take over and so that um, they will distill this information for us. And I think soon data will be able to predict where, what you want to do even before you know what you want to do. I mean, how often um, when you're, you know, say you've been looking for a flight to travel somewhere or you've been looking at a destination and then you forget about it. Next time you go online, you suddenly find ads to that destination served up to you. Special deal, great holiday. It's because, you know, sometimes you've only sent an email to somebody asking, hey, are you going to be around and planning to be on holiday? Because they read your emails as well. So that's the level of data that, um, that is being aggregated about you, which is available um, for brands. So I think this is, this, is the, this is the change we are going to see. Now in Sri Lanka, we might say, oh, okay, well, we're not really, we haven't really got there yet. But I don't agree because I think, you know, 33% of, uh, of our population is on the internet right now. And year on year, I mean, 33%, you might say, so that's not a lot. That is a lot because the 33% are the people who have the spending power. It's a huge, huge amount of people with spending power who are on the internet. And also we are seeing a growth of something like 19% year on year on digital spend. So, so you're seeing, you know, changes actually taking place. And I'm, I'm sure it's even, you know, this, is, uh, this information is about three months old. I'm sure it's even changed more now and it's probably getting, uh, you know, even more. So I think, you know, take something like Uber. They have something like 80,000 deliveries a day. 80,000. Can you imagine the information Uber has about all the people who order? What kind of food? You know, what's popular? What's trending? What do people order? They must know so much about you. Now, the important thing, I mean, you, you take something like Netflix. I don't know how many of you are on Netflix, but Netflix knows my personality. They know what kind of films I like to watch or what kind of series. And every, every day virtually they send me a, uh, a mail and say, hey, uh, Neela, we have just uploaded some of these films. We think you'd love them. They know what kind of films I like and they serve them up to me because the data that they have on me on the type of films I watch, programs, they know what kind of person I am. They can kind of figure out what kind of, do I like violence? Do I like sports? You know, am I a romantic? You know, am I into food? Do I watch a lot of food programs? So that can tell them a lot about me as well. So I think, you know, these are the, um, the kind of challenges that we as um, brand marketeers have to really consider. You know, this is the new, new way of doing things. I mean, I, I think there's something like an estimated 5,000 data points on each of every one of us because we leave a massive da data footprint online just by our behavior online. So I think, you know, it's something we should look at. I think uh, as a country, we are slow adopters in e-commerce, uh, in using data, in uh, actually embracing digital. I think we are behind. Uh, if you look at many other countries, uh, they're way ahead of us, which is, again, I, I stress strange because we are so far ahead in terms of uh, mobile usage, 
uh, in terms of uh, you know 4G, 5G, all these things that many countries don't have. So I think it's um, these are some observations um, that I would like to make. I think I think companies need to embrace it. I think companies need to look at how they can use data uh, to be much more effective in uh, how they engage consumers. Uh, they can also use data to know what kind of products in the future are going to work, how are people behaving, what are they looking for, so that you know, when you're developing your products, uh, it also is a huge you know, uh, a wealth of knowledge. But it's how you capture the data, it's how you use it, um, and um, how you plan uh, to engage customers. So I think I'm gonna kind of stop there um, and take some questions. If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks, Neela. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, I think it was a fantastic, um, uh, quick view of the of what's happening in the market, and uh, I mean, it just as a actually a wealth of knowledge. Um, as you know, uh, Neela is not only a stalwart in the industry, but uh, we can just see that she's a moving encyclopedia. Um, so, uh, excellent, Neela. Uh, uh, before I open the whole house for discussion, uh, just a few questions, Neela. Uh, I know that uh, Densu is uh, part of organizing the Olympics uh, yes. in, in Japan, uh, and 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 actually, you, you are the chairman and also the managing director of Densu in Sri Lanka. Uh, would you like to share a few thoughts about? Uh, uh, the developments there? Well, it's interesting. Um, they are doing a, a kind of a trial something this month, right? They are doing a, a, a skating um, uh, kind of, with, I think just a few countries as a trial, as a pilot project, which is happening this month. And I think they're testing the water to see if that works well. And they are able to manage it in a way that is sustainable. Um, I think their plan is to definitely go ahead next year. They want to do the Olympics next year, but of course it will have to be changed. I don't think that they would be able to manage the level of crowds uh, that they would like to have, because I don't think we're going to have a vaccine, uh, you know, anytime soon. My guess is it's gonna take some more time. So I think that um, here would be a real huge opportunity again, because a lot of it will be virtual. A lot of people will have to watch uh, uh, the Olympics online. So I think, you know, it's going to be an interesting time. But the plan, as I know, is to, uh, is to go for it next year, unless something major happens. Uh, because I think, you know, the world probably has to learn to live with COVID uh, in the short term till they find a vaccine. And if they are lucky and the vaccine does happen, then, of course, things will change because everybody can be vaccinated before they go for the Olympics, but I would, I think we should wait and see this test, this uh, pilot project that they're doing this month. Uh, I think there are like Russia, China, Japan, US. I think there are like five or six countries that are doing this, um, the, uh, the skating, not skating. What am I saying? Gymnastics. Okay. They have a yeah gymnastics tournament. It's a pre-Olympic uh, tournament. So let's see how it works and uh, how you know, how they manage uh, the pandemic within that uh, period. So, Neela, yeah, thing, let's hope so. Yeah, um, I've been knowing Neela for the last about 20 years and Neela is, I mean, what is so good about her is that she's so contemporary of what's happening. I remember uh, during the time of the war, Neela was a real strong proponent of uh, looking at how we are going to develop the Northeast uh, post the cessation of hostilities and and I remember the UNDP appointed her uh, as one of the key um, uh, consultants in terms of driving uh, Northeast reconciliation and post-revival growth. So, yeah, that's, uh, you know, your, I suppose as a media icon, you have to keep your uh, feet on the ground. Uh, my question is, how, how do you uh, live with COVID? Because you're running a huge organization uh, Densu in Sri Lanka, you're handling large brands uh, in the country, and I know that you're going for a huge pitch tomorrow also. Uh, so how, how do you live with COVID? Are you, are you staying at home? So um, 
interesting, uh, Rohanza. We, we were closed for three months and then we went back to work in July um, and we did it in, in stages, 50% of the staff on and 50% off. So we have about 140 staff. And, um, and then in August, uh, we were fully back. But now as of this week, uh, we decided to work from home for the next two weeks because of this outbreak that has happened of the Minuangaro and because we're seeing the spread is, it's, it's like we can't really manage the spread at the moment. So we thought, you know, to make life easy because so many people use public transport. We are very worried about the safety of our staff um, and, you know, to protect them, uh, we have uh, arranged for people to work from home for the next two weeks and then we'll review that situation. Uh, however, we do have some segments of our staff working. Uh, we have our own in-house production house and because there's so much work going on. So there are some people who are coming into work and we have a very strict protocol uh, in terms of sanitization, mask wearing and all the things that they have to do, uh, temperature checking. I mean, these are things that we've been doing right throughout but we'll obviously you know, be even more careful and, and wherever possible, we, we, are not, we are encouraging our staff, uh, uh, we are you know, funding them to, to try to travel to work without public transport, but using you know, uh, individual vehicles, you know, Uber, things like that for their own safety. So it's tough, um, um, you know, but it is what it is, Rohanta, there's nothing we can do. We've just got to make the best of the situation and manage things, um, just hope that it can be brought under control and uh, you know maybe within a month we might be in a better place yeah Nila, the the group that is actually tuned on to you is a very international community there is people from seashells there are people from doha there are people from maldives uh, and of course um, a lot of sri lankans from multinational circuits from the fronteras of the world manchi uh, so you are having a whole uh, array of people, but I'm sorry, I'm going to put you on the box now. So no do problem. You think, so do you think Brandix have handled the PR well? <laughs> <laughs> Rohanta! <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a very hard one because I think that uh, it's, it's a very hard one to comment. I always believe um, that it's much easier you know, if something has happened that is not, that is bad, that has happened, is, is, is to really inform people right from the get go. Uh, because I think people, you know, understand things happen. Um, and I think that, you know, um, when, when it's a little bit gray, it leaves a lot of room to interpret things negatively. Uh, there's also a lot of, you know, uh, back talking and uh, bad feeling. So I think that, um, yeah, maybe I might have done it a little differently. I might have, yes. But I think, you know, I, I think it's a very hard one for them because uh, obviously, you know, they're a big international brand and they have a great reputation in the country. They have created so much of employment and, you know, credit to them. They're a great company. And this has been a, probably a huge blow to them uh, because these are big companies that are iconic, you know, in the country. So I, I understand their pain and the stress that they must be going through. I would, I don't know what I, you know, I don't know how I would have handled it. Sometimes, you know, it's easy when we are not in the seat, in the hot seat, we can always find answers. But when you're in the hot seat, there's so much of advice and so many people saying so many things. Sometimes it's really hard to, to stay focused and, you know, stay the, stay the course because, you know, you get diverted and so much diverse views come in. And, and this is not like anything else, right? It has a huge impact on the country. Uh, and one that, you know, is, is every day, it's a shock because every day you're seeing it going somewhere where you never thought it's going to go. So I think it's very hard, I know, you know, and I think that um, it could happen to anyone, you know, Rohanta, it could happen to anyone. I think the important thing is the protocol procedures are really important. And I think, uh, you know, nipping it, nipping it in the bud immediately uh, and, you know, stopping any further discussion is to be upfront and tell it like it is. I, I think that's, 
you know, that's how I, I, I see it. Yeah. And uh, so they are, they are saying it as it is from their perspective, but the thing is they were late. So people may not be believing exactly what they're saying. I think they had said this from day one might have been different, but I think they, they took a while to respond. And I think that maybe uh, led to a lot of, um, you know, grayness and doubt. And, uh, and that's, that's the pity. Because, I you know, mean, the, most, imp the like most important thing is even during this whole COVID time, what customers and what people will remember is how brands behave during this time. Mm -hmm. You know, how much were they with you as a consumer? What did they do for you? You know, were they there during this difficult time? Brands that really went out of their way to actually support customers during these difficult times are the brands that will always be remembered. And I think we should always look back and, you know, what was the impact we made uh, on consumers at a difficult time when people were all experiencing a difficult time? Where were brands supporting you? I think that's, I think brands have to ask that question from themselves. What was the role they played? I think that's, uh, that's a fantastic uh, uh, piece that you just now quoted, uh, Neela. I mean, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you know, but Neela was uh, handling the Sri Lankan Airlines account. And I remember when I was chairman of Sri Lanka Tourism, we used to work very closely. Uh, I mean, so uh, Neela is someone who always gets involved in the national issues. And she's also very vocal in what she says. And you saw her point of view. Uh, but I think what you just now said, where people will remember the brands that were with you is, is, is so true, so true. Um, my, uh, uh, before I open the house to questions, uh, how, how do you see um, this industry? Because uh, last year, I think we did about 72 billion uh, in advertising, and this year we have done about 55 billion. There is a drop of over 23%. Uh, uh, do, you all, do you all feel this in, in your ad agency? Of course we do. Of course we do. We see a lot of cutbacks, Rohantha. It's a it's a tough year, very tough year, and uh, um, yeah. But clients won't let us drop on our service quality. They demand the same, but you know, for a lot less, uh, uh, the revenues have definitely dropped, yeah. and it's a struggle. But that's a global global issue. It's not only here, right across the world. I mean, uh, we're experiencing this. But that's why I'm saying that I, I don't know whether we'll ever get back to the way things were. And I mean, I see a big shift uh, happening, uh, moving towards, you know, e-commerce, because I think today communications have to have an outcome. I think that that's where, you know, businesses are going to look at it. Um, it's not just communicating awareness, but, you know, how do you drive an outcome? So I think that agencies are going to be challenged also on how you drive uh, conversion um, as part of uh, the comms. It's, it's not easy, but at least uh, on mainstream media, it's not measurable because those are like reach and frequency and things like that, which are not directly measurable. But when it comes to something like programmatic, you can 100% measure it, definitely you can measure it. So, so we are seeing globally, not here, but then globally, we are seeing a huge shift to programmatic because brands want to see, uh, you know, um, a, a sort of return on their investment. And, and the only medium that can do that today is programmatic um, and digital. We are not really seeing it uh, in mainstream media. It's not possible, mainstream media can't, can't deliver that. It's not. It's not within their scope. Yeah, Nila, your your the programmatic arm or programmatic arm is Isoba, right? No, it's Mnet. Okay. Uh, Mnet is a trading platform. Isoba is our, our digital agency, and of course, Mnet works very closely uh, with Isoba. They are all you know working together as teams. So how many yeah. brand, how many companies are now into this? Because I I remember I think globally almost sixty nine percent of the people are into programmatic advertising. Yeah. Well, I think that, um, well, Dentsu, I mean, interestingly, I think uh, the global turnover of Dentsu is something like 55 billion US dollars, out of which 63% is on, on digital. That's the shift. 
And now um, we recently um, have a new CEO, very dynamic woman called Wendy Clark. And um, she, you know, um, is like a breath of fresh air because she's bringing a lot of energy into the business. And, uh, you know, they're really looking at total commerce as a solution to clients. So comms becomes a part of your total commerce uh, offering to clients. So that's where it's shifting globally. And uh, we are also, we also have a lot of, um, you know, we have a company that is very big in uh, what they call uh, CRM um, and lead generation called Merkel. And they are the biggest, uh, biggest uh, lead generation company, CRM company in the world. And they, come, you know, work with data points. And uh, we have just started doing some work here in Sri Lanka. Uh, with Merkel, with some big brands in Sri Lanka, where we are looking at lead, uh, lead generation. Okay. So, you know, again, uh, programmatic and lead generation are very closely linked. So that the kind of advertising you do, uh, you're serving up ads to customers uh, in a way that is relevant to them at the right time when they're looking for that particular thing. Okay. There's no point serving somebody an ad when they're not interested in that type of product. Yeah. So, so you, you have to know that. So that is part of, you know, where it's all shifting. It's, a, it's amazing what is happening in the world today, you know? I mean, five years ago, 10 years ago, if you told me this, I would be like blown away by what I'm seeing. But it is happening right before our eyes. Right. Uh, can I open the, the house? For of any course. Questions? Yeah. Uh, guys, uh, any questions? Please unmute and introduce yourself and ask the question. Or you can just straight away ask the question. Uh, hi, this is um, Kiritaran, and I work for HSBC. So uh, I would like to um, get some insight as to the um, awareness of your clients uh, in, in Sri Lanka as to their adoption towards this uh, programmatic or the digital media. Like, how adoptive are they? Or are they still, you know, mainly only focused on mainstream media? Like uh, your views on it? Yep, very good question. Uh, Nila? Sadly, they're slow. Slow adopters. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, there are, if you, even if you look at the e-commerce sites that are there now, the UI UX part of it, most of the sites are quite poor. Um, and that's because companies are not willing to invest in a really good UI UX experience. What companies don't realize is that the e-commerce site is really their showroom online. And the experience you have on their e-commerce site is like going into their showroom now. Companies don't think twice about spending 20, 30 million to do a fancy showroom, but they will begrudge you to spend 5 million on doing a stellar UI UX um, experience website where, you know, where your, your customer has a very good experience uh, going in and they can purchase online and it's easy to do. Um, so that, that is a very good example of um, something that I'm experiencing now. I'm trying to tell clients, you need to have, you know, if you want to really get into that e-commerce space, you've got to invest in a very good e-commerce site. There's no point doing a, a cheap website and thinking that's e-commerce, it's not. And that's what people don't seem to understand. They haven't got their head around actually investing in this. They don't see this as something that they need to do. They look at it, Okay, how can I get, you know, oh, I know somebody down, you know, who can do it for 500,000 rupees. Yes, you can do it for 500,000. But what is the customer experience? So even in terms of programmatic, um, clients still, you know, if you look at a, a traditional uh, budget, they don't even commit 3% to 4% of their media spends onto digital. Whereas globally, it's at 20, 30% now is what brands are spending. And that I think is partly because they don't really understand the value it brings. 
and uh, they're reluctant to actually do that. And I think it's a pity because um, I think companies who do it um, fast and who invest quickly, they are the ones who are going to win. And um, I think that one good thing, I mean, the only upside of this uh, COVID, of the pandemic, is that many brands are forced you know, to rethink their digital strategies. Earlier on, it was like, okay, you just have a Facebook and you manage, do a few posts and, and oh, I'm, I'm digital, you know, I'm, I've got a Facebook page and I'm, you know, posting 12 posts a week and I'm happy with that. But that's not it. It's not about how many likes. Who cares about likes? It's about the engagement and how long do people engage and what do they engage on? The information that you, get, you, you aggregate on that customer and then how you save that data and then how you retarget that customer because you know what the customer came and looked for and then you go back to them and say, hey, you know, uh, we know you're interested in this and we have a great offer. So I think um, we are quite far behind and um, I would like to see, you know, brands invest a lot more because they will win if they do. Believe me, you and I, all of us, we live on our phones every minute of the day. On average, a Sri Lankan looks at their phone 200 times a day. Think about that, 200 times a day. You know, how many times a day do you look at the TV or the newspaper or listen to the radio? So I hope I answered your question. Nila, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting question, but the latest research shows that most Sri Lankans here trust, or 92% of the people trust um, TV, and uh, only 12% of the tree, uh, people uh, uh, test or trust um, uh, digital, uh, which is the research done by Kanta. Uh, what is your reaction to that? So when they say TV, what do they mean by TV? And also when you say digital, what do they mean by digital? They probably mean Facebook. Most Sri Lankans, when you ask them, what do you think, what is internet to you? It's Facebook. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we're saying here. Because Facebook, I mean, let's be honest, there's so much of fake news and so much of stuff that is on Facebook, which is why they don't trust it. Yeah. yeah. But I think if you, if you, if, if Kanta had done that and say, and they had done a measurement and said, okay, what is internet to you? You will find 70% of people, and we have that stat, 70% of people see Facebook as internet. They, they think of it as in the same, same light. Because Sri Lanka is not a search market. The reason being people haven't really gone into e-commerce in a big way yet. So search is not, not where we are, but Facebook usage is massive. We have 7 million users on Facebook. So, so that's, the, that's the thing. But I, I, I think that they have to, you have to look at the, that Kanta research in the context of what I said, because you can't take it in, that, in the way that they have, uh, they have framed it. I, I, won't, I don't think that's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, how you define. Guys, any other um, question? I like the question that uh, Kiritaran asked, very interesting question. Uh, guys, anybody else? Um, again, so um, uh, touching on the digital marketing or the the programmatic marketing. So um, it's just a thought or my question, like uh, shouldn't uh, the advertising agencies uh, be an ambassador to you know promote uh, the real benefits of these to the organizations because like then they can be the real drivers and the market makers in other words to you know drive the whole marketing uh, the, the face of marketing or the the drive of marketing in sri lanka maybe yep. the companies are not yet uh, convinced because they do not have the right facts or evidences provided to them and uh, I don't think not, I mean, not everyone, but uh, most of them would not be, you know, investing enough time in, you know, getting the right data or the facts done for their marketing campaigns or their research. So um, maybe as advertising agents or the, I mean, agencies shouldn't 
it be their uh, contribution to to get this up and running yeah it uh, could be it could be yanila yeah i absolutely agree and i think that's what is happening because a lot of the mainstream agencies are very strong on the traditional media um so perhaps to them uh they would like to um probably you know keep it um as long as they can in that area and i think that um digital is something that not everyone is familiar with and i think as i said we are slow adopters so even not only clients even agencies are slow um and i think that is something uh, absolutely valid uh, agencies should be promoting it but that's because agencies themselves have been slow to adopt so i think that that is part of the problem so you have uh, the brand teams you have the agencies everybody's you know like okay we don't you know we're happy with this because um with a traditional media plan you can you know determine reach and frequencies and you know you can give your you know your rating points and all of that and it it works for everybody and um you know you can get up and justify it to your marketing head or your ceo and say okay i reached so much and i did this and it looks everyone's comfortable with it yeah. digital is a little bit more uh, a new uh, new canvas and people feel a little bit unfamiliar and so yes uh, there is a little bit of hesitancy on the part of agency and on the top part of the brand teams as well and uh, yeah i think you know it's companies like us uh, who have to drive the change um that's what we are trying to do we are it's taking time but we are pushing and uh, our company isaba which is one of the leading digital agencies globally um really driving it with amnet uh, we are trying we're talking to clients we are trying to educate them um we're doing our best uh hopefully uh, we'll we'll break break more ground as we go yeah um as you know guys uh, uh, neela was uh, owning a company called mccann grants which actually the dad started and now it's the second generation who has taken over uh so it's it's uh, it, it's i mean they're doing a fantastic contribution to the industry uh uh yep yeah, open to questions just to to just to say add to that we sold the business to dentsu in 2017 so now we are the part of the dentsu family mm -hmm. <laughs> um sorry one last question from me again uh, yep shoot go ahead yeah so um, this is on the mainstream media or the tv uh, advertising so i would like to know whether uh, um what do you call the uh, foreign channels that are been viewed in sri lanka are these also taken into consideration um, when they take um, what do you call the ground data to do their marketing in tv because what i see is uh, with the with dialog and peo tv they they are creating a space to advertise within the uh, programs of the uh, within the international programs because nowadays what happens is uh, if you take most of the indian channels which have been viewed by the sri lankans the hindi programs or the um or the tamil programs for that matter so these channels do uh, have an option uh, nowadays we are uh, when they start or when they start their commercial uh, ads they do give this timing saying we will be uh, back in 5 minutes or 10 minutes so this particular time frame is been captured by uh, dialog or slt and they do their own promotions so if if uh, this particular data can be collated or if this is been consumed and uh, if the right market is identified i believe uh, even that particular space can be best utilized in terms of marketing because uh, yeah good question neela um at the moment we work with um, with uh, ac nielsen they have what they call the people meters and uh, all the data is compiled on the viewership of these people meters so it's actually a very small sample size it's only 500 uh 
uh, 500 people meters. They are talking about increasing it, but as of now, it's only 500. So all the media planning uh, that is done is based on this 500 people meters. Now, it does not capture DTH. It's not captured. Um, there was a, a talk that Dialogue is going to do something of their own, where they're going to try and capture this data, but nothing has been, uh, nothing has come out as yet. Okay. Uh, guys, we have one last question because I, I got to let uh, Neela go uh, and uh, uh, it's seven o'clock. One last question. I guess no one has a question. <laughs> Uh, you know, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, uh, actually, thank you for the answers. Like, uh, something which I had in mind for a long time got clear today. On the thank you very much, guys. I think, uh, Neela, the last question, let me post the last question to you. Uh, I mean, uh, most of these guys are, you know, you know, studying for their masters and they are, you know, they're, they are like, uh, you know, they have in the Staffordshire MBA program, I think it's ranked about 37 in the world, and uh, they're going through a lot of change while they are while they are working also. Uh, the the question uh, what I have is that what is the advice you would uh, give uh, them, Neela, because you know that we don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know whether there'll be a lockdown. We don't know whether this spread is going to continue. I just got to know that there's a police curfew in Katunayaka. Uh, so well, how would you, how do you, what is your advice, Neela, to them? Oh my God, I wish I could, I wish I could read into the future myself. I really, I think you have to take one day at a time. It's very mm -hmm. hard to plan. You know, as a business, all I can say for what, I mean, the only thing that we can control is our costs. We can't control the revenue because we don't know, you know, what's going to happen. So managing your costs in whatever business you're doing is becomes the most important thing. Uh, and also the sustainability of the business, because I think it's so important to try for, and find ways to, you know, retain your people. Um, um, and, you know, I think I know that a lot of companies have had to cut back on people and I'm doing my utmost personally to, to try to keep everyone, um, but it is hard. And um, I, think, I think you just, it's very hard to plan. You can't even, I mean, you can't even plan a month ahead, let alone a three-year plan. Those days we would do a three-year business plan, you know, and review it every year. I mean, my God, you can't even do a three-month business plan now. Mm. It's that difficult. So um, I think, you know, um, stay safe. I think be be realistic about the situation, um, and just hope that it's going to. You know, I think we have to do our bit as best as we can to try and reduce the burden on the state. You know, to be sensible about what we do, and uh, and also, if you're running a business, you're running a team, then you know, try to keep your team. Uh, you know, connected. Uh, you have to look at new ways of doing things, uh, innovate as we go. Uh, but it is a certainly a scary prospect because I think we in Sri Lanka we were like, you know, uh, cheering ourselves on, like, hey, you know, we really got it right. We're really, you know, great because we were managing it so well. And then, oh my God, you know, <laughs> everything went crazy uh, just in a matter of days. That's how unpredictable it is. So I think, um, I wish I had a magic bullet or a magic solution for everybody. I don't. I yeah. think we just have to take it day at a time. Thanks, Neela. I, I want to thank Capit for presenting this uh, program with you. And uh, uh, thank you for everybody who participated. And it was fantastic presenting this program. And uh, thank you, Neela. And uh, we wish you all the very best. And uh, thank you. And uh, uh, I hope we can again touch base maybe in another two, three months time. Uh, maybe it might be uh, uh, <laughs> on the beach and maybe in a more <laughs> present, uh, place. Thank you very much and uh, signing off. Thank you very Not much. Enough. Thank you. Thanks, Stay guys. safe, Mom. everyone. Okay, bye.
Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you, sir. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Lovely catching you again. <laughs>